Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, 132 on this gorgeous Wednesday afternoon, May 26, 2021. Hello, my name is Carl Hawkinson, and uh, I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension, Hennepin County. And this is yet another session for our Twin Cities Metro Growers Network. Today, we're going to uh, uh, veer away from uh, horticultural topics and uh, talk about some exciting things going on at the USDA Farm Services Agency, which will help growers access uh, all the programs and uh, funding sources to help them do a better job with their horticultural practices. So uh, we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, but first, uh, uh, just some introductions. Um, and uh, before that, I just wanted to, a few brief things about the Growers Network. We started that as a way for growers across the metro to connect and, and meet and share and network and uh, share ideas, uh, share practices, share resources. And uh, it's all about informal, informative learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, go to the Twin Cities Growers, uh, Metro Growers Network webpage on the Sustainable Farming Association webpage. And that's who we partner with. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Katie Federal from SFA. Hello, Katie. Could you just Hi, say a, a word or two about SFA? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Katie Federal. I am the communications director with Sustainable Farming Association. And SFA, I, we're going to probably be mixing up FSA and SFA a lot today. So buckle up, but we'll do our best. Um, SFA is really about supporting um, regenerative and sustainable farming practices that are healthy for our communities, our economies, as well as the environment. Um, and much like the Twin Cities Growers Network, SFA is a large group. Um, we have different chapters all over the state. And it's about connecting farmers to farmers, growers and other growers to learn from each other and share resources and knowledge um, so that we can all be better basically. So um, it's, a, it's a good, social community and as well as a good knowledge base. Um, and no matter if you if you farm 50 acres or um, just grow in your backyard, there's a lot of uh, like-minded folks and um, good resources to share with an SFA. So um, I'll post some links in the chat, but yeah, that's why we're paired up with Carl here because it's really the same ethos around uh, the Twin Cities Growers Network. Uh, thanks a lot, Katie, and thanks for all your help. And yeah, uh, you all know about the chat function by now, and uh, we like to keep this interactive. Um, and check out the webpage. We have uh, resources and recordings and of all our past events, and we've done some pretty cool things, I think. And uh, so with that, we're going to today talk about um, the USDA, United States Department of Ag, uh, Farm Services Agency, and uh, the goings on there with uh, trying to reach out to uh, urban growers and growers of all kinds that aren't necessarily the commodity growers, which would be their traditional uh, kind of clientele, you might say. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Daniel and uh, Christina. Would you like to introduce yourselves? And then I think you can take it away. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I'm Daniel Mahoney. I work out of the Minnesota USDA Farm Service Agency office in St. Paul as a public affairs and outreach coordinator. Um, and so we've been fortunate to be selected for a urban ag county committee pilot program uh, for Minneapolis. And so I've been working on having some really great conversations uh, with growers and producers throughout the metro here um, ever since December when that was announced. Um, I will pass it over for Chris to introduce herself. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Fast. I work alongside with Dan here at the Minnesota Farm Service Agency. I'm an Ag Program Specialist and the Urban Ag County Committee is one of the areas that I help oversee and clarify any policy questions that go on and assist with some outreach. So happy to be here and look forward to working with a lot of you hopefully after this call. Perfect. Um, so I don't, I don't know how many of you are really aware of the Farm Service Agency. We are one of many USDA or United States Department of Agriculture um, agencies. Um, and we most notably have um, field offices through most counties in the state and work directly uh, with 
producers of agricultural commodities um, across a really broad spectrum of um, programs. And they go from everything from conservation programs and price support to disaster and to loans. Um, and those are really broad categories of, of the different types of programs that we have. Um, and I would say that when you look at the United States Department of Agriculture, we are only one portion of what that um, department has to do, right? So we're fortunate to have a county committee structure um, that lends itself to the urban ag pilot. And so um, we get the ability to push this project forward. Um, kind of just giving you an overview of where we're going with the presentation before I start to throw up slides. Um, what I'm gonna try to do is provide a overview of the USDA um, initiatives on urban agriculture. And like I said, that includes multiple activities um, from different agencies. Um, and then talk about the county committee structure itself and look at how that maybe differs for urban ag versus, you know, maybe our traditional county committee structure. Talk about what the process is for participating in that urban ag or traditional county committee structure. And then talk more specifically about what are the programs and funding sources that the US Department of Ag has for urban agriculture. And then more specifically talk about the programs at the Farm Service Agency that we feel align with some of the operations that we know about in the Twin Cities metro area. Okay, so what is the impetus for the urban ag um, COC pilot that we have here? It is the 2018 Farm Bill, which provided an initiative known as the Office of Urban Agriculture and innovative production. And you'll see that we have a number of acronyms um, or government speak throughout this. And I'll try to explain these things as we go, but if there's clarification needed, please interrupt. Um, it has a five or more year pilot project led by NRCS, which is the Natural Resource Conservation Service to engage with urban growers and gardeners to encourage and promote urban and indoor and other emerging agricultural practices. So that Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production is responsible for seeing a number of different projects across a broad spectrum, which includes the establishment of a federal advisory committee for urban ag and innovative production. And that the period for application has been passed and they haven't named um, the individuals that will be serving on that, but that's something that's being currently implemented. Um, awarding competitive grants um, through NEFA administering community compost and food waste um, reduction projects in at least 10 states through cooperative agreements. And these cooperative agreements were actually recently announced here um, in the last couple of weeks as being open. Two states have already received those in the fiscal year 2020. Um, and we are looking at um, getting those additional eight states through this program. And so those, that funding is currently available through NRCS. Um, establish at least 10 new pilot county committees in urban areas, um, which includes Minneapolis and, and is why we're here. Um, developing policies and resources to assist urban producers um, more specifically. And of course, this urban ag county pilot is part of defining those um, pieces of information that help inform those policies and resources. And then advising the secretary on the development of policies and outreach. So talking more specifically about the role of FSA and the 10 selected locations. So we have our 2020 selected locations and then we have our 2021 locations that were announced in December of 2020. So that includes Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hey, Daniel, um, we have a question already uh, yeah. on the last slide. Um, yeah. Given that, Lori was wondering, given that we have another farm bill soon, will all of those things be renewed as like kind of the normal course of business with an USDA in the future? Or? Well, and I'll kind of go through, you know, the structure of a pilot on that and, and what the intent is, but it would be dependent on what passes through Congress. Okay. Yep. 
always at FSA, you know, we're subject to the changes of the new farm bills and, and new legislation. But this, the structure of this is, is for five years. Um, so talking about the pilot and, and what are the goals here, it's a small scale project um, that helps the agency understand the time, dedication, budget, and program limitations um, to that particular project. And hopefully it's a realistic illustration of how a project could be implemented on a larger scale. And so you will notice that we have you know, urban ag pilot um, cities all around the country. And so you know, we're learning through this process about you know, what is the truly best implementation process. And on a micro scale, that same thing is happening here in Minnesota as we go through that pilot, we're learning you know, how to structure and how to navigate this. And then it's an opportunity to collaborate with the team, um, share ideas, provide feedback, address challenges, um, manage risks and, and resolve um, areas of deficiency. And then it's that tool to assist in development of new policies as well, um, is consider updates to current policy to ensure the mission of the agency is accomplished for urban producers. And so we know through our traditional um, COC or county committee structure that we get a lot of feedback um, from those members regarding the implementation of our programs. And we expect that same kind of feedback and engagement um, for urban ag county committees. So just kind of an overview of the structure of county committees. And so what the pilot does is it kind of restructures or re-envisions an existing structure. And so we're using all of the existing provisions for our county committees, um, which exist with each of our USDA service centers with an FSA presence throughout the state and nation. So there are three to 11 members, depending on the size of that particular jurisdiction. Um, there are three year terms. So each um, county committee member serves a three year term. Um, they are eligible to serve up to three consecutive three year terms. Um, members and advisors are compensated for their time and travel. So your travel from your place of residence to you know, the duty station or that county office where that meeting is being held um, is, is mileage and then you are compensated for your time in those meetings as well. And then with those committee meetings, there are both regular and executive sessions. Regular sessions are general information that is open to the public, whereas executive section or session um, information is going to be closed um, and it's gonna be information that is pertinent to maybe an individual or a situation that isn't um, public. And Daniel, I'm gonna jump in here. Yep. Isn't one of the ideas that, uh, you know, the FSA offices currently county uh, committees are pretty pretty long ways for anybody in Hennepin or Ramsey to reach. And is that one of the basic ideas just to make it easier for people to participate? Yep. So, and I, I would say too, that it's important to note that there was and is a county committee structure that covers our metropolitan and urban areas even before this. So as is indicated on this particular slide, the urban ag county committee is administered through our Farmington USDA FSA office, which serves um, Dakota, Washington, Ramsey and Scott counties, right? And so Minneapolis um, for the most part has been out of our Hennepin, um, office, right, Hennepin office, and um, Ramsey as a county has been administered out of that Farmington office. And so for those urban ag growers that fall outside of the boundaries of the urban ag structure during this pilot, um, I want to stress that there is still a county committee that they can participate in the election and serve and you know, participate in providing their voice um, to USDA. And I think when we're looking at you know, why a separate urban ag COC, um, you kind of have to look at some of the roles that a county committee plays. So for example, one of the programs that we'll talk about later is a farm storage facility loan. And that is a loan for storage or handling equipment um, low interest loans and up to $100,000, our county committees are actually the approval authority. 
And so they look at those loans and they say, you know, is this a, a normal, you know, storage or handling equipment for this particular, you know, crop or um, process, right? And we know that urban agricultural practices can look different than rural agricultural processes. And so having a county committee that is informed and aware of urban ag practices can be beneficial um, in that consideration. So that's just an example of you know, program implementation where having an urban ag county committee is important. And then on top of that, just recognizing that the information and advice that urban ag um, committee members provide is probably going to be different than what we get from rural members. And, and to be clear, to start out with, with this pilot, and it may change in the future depending on how it goes, we're just talking residents, uh, uh, this would be St. Paul and Minneapolis. Yep. Yeah. And, and I would stress to, you know, while we are looking at on the screen here, you're gonna see the boundaries of that county committee jurisdiction that include Minneapolis and St. Paul proper. We are interested in connecting with our metro and urban and suburban growers that fall outside of those areas. Um, I don't think it's a secret that the cooperation and participation in USDA programs is quite robust in rural areas and maybe less robust in some of our metropolitan areas. And so as we continue to expand um, this pilot and, and grow you know, the effect of it, it'll be very essential for us to have cooperation and voter lists that reflect the true number of uh, growers that we have in that broader metropolitan area. So we kind of talked a little bit earlier about the notion that there are traditionally three to 11 members under a county committee. So you'll notice on the screen that we have three local administrative areas um, broken up across the COC jurisdiction. And so each of these individuals would serve a three year term and there would be one individual elected to represent each local administrative area. Uh, Daniel, we have a question in the chat wondering um, how these administrative areas were determined. Um, and they point out that like LA1 is only Minneapolis, the third one is in St. Paul, and the second overlaps two cities. Yep. So this is another example of like when we talk about that notion of a pilot and trying to figure out, you know, what is the administrative process for this? And so when we selected um, Minneapolis and St. Paul, as that you know, COC jurisdiction, we had to figure out some kind of geographical boundary that could break up that larger COC jurisdiction into three roughly equal geographic sections. So a lot of times under traditional committee structures, we utilize townships um, as our geographic um, boundaries. But in this particular situation, Minneapolis is all one township. St. Paul is all one township. Um, so we looked at different things like, you know, neighborhoods or, you know, geographical boundaries to try to figure out something that we could utilize as a geographical boundary that would split that up, you know, properly. Um, the other thing that I would say is part of the process for managing a county committee structure is trying to make sure that the population of farmers um, within each LAA or voters within each LAA are roughly equal, you know, so that there's a equal voting population within each. And because we entered into this with a less than robust number of urban ag producers, it was fairly e easy for us to see that those are roughly equal in terms of their distribution of, of voters within that. But as we gain participation and move through the pilot, there will, potentially be the need to adjust. Um, the other thing is, is that um, as we evaluate some of these boundaries that we do, we hope that we can get advice and you know, ideas from our county committee members that are identified through this election to help define some of that administrative process that goes along with this as well. And so if you just wanna access FSA, this. LAA one, two, and three, it doesn't really matter. This has more to do with being on the committee and, and that sort of thing, which you'll talk about later. Yep, yep, exactly. And it's kind of- this that, is just kind of administrative stuff. Manage an election. Yeah. You know, and I think 
the other part of this is, is you know, through you know, evaluation of this pilot um, and information that we, we get from our, our future COC members and you know, stakeholders within the community, you know, we're open to the notion that in future years, this LAA jurisdiction can expand. So talking more specifically about eligibility to vote. So who gets to participate, who gets to vote, you know, within a COC election, you have to be within legal voting age, you have to have an interest in a farming operation that produces an agricultural commodity. Um, and of course, there's an exception on the legal um, voting age piece. Um, but speaking practically, um, the terminology that's used in our handbooks and procedure is participate or cooperate. So when we talk about participate, I think that's fairly clear what that means. It would be, let's say we have the coronavirus food assistance program. You are participating in that program um, for say your commercial sales. Cooperate means that you're providing um, your address and information to USDA FSA and are indicating and have provided an indication that you're producing within that urban ag COC jurisdiction. Um, and I think the distinction here is important because a lot of our programs, if not all of our programs at the Farm Service Agency focus on commercial production, you know, or, or for profit sales of agricultural commodities. That is not universally true across the board for all USDA programs. For example, the Natural Resource Conservation Service provides technical assistance and things like um, environmental quality incentive program benefits to producers, whether they're growing commercially or for their personal consumption or for donation. And so when we're talking about cooperating and producing, we're talking about anybody who is growing or producing, you know, agriculturally within those boundaries. So more specifically, how to cooperate, we talked about providing an address, providing your information to USDA. And that's most commonly done through an 80-2047 form, um, which is the USDA customer data worksheet. And so when we provide that to a customer, it includes things like name, address, email, um, phone, uh, tax ID, and demographic information. And so you can provide you know, as little or as much of that information as you choose to provide um, a tax ID or your personal demographic information is, you know, certainly optional. Um, the address is something that we utilize as part of the election process in order to send a postcard to you notifying you that the nomination period is open and um, very importantly, sending a ballot directly to um, the at people who have identified themselves as part of the, the election process. And uh, I'll just jump in here. Many of you on here might know uh, some of the folks we've had on before, Moses and uh, uh, the Keisha Winter, uh, Witter and uh, uh, Jake Jarecki, who we work with, uh, folks that are getting into um, farming and and have FSA loans. And they've, you know, you got to get on board with FSA first. And uh, this is... There's some bureaucracy in wall involved and there's a bunch of uh, acronyms, but uh, hang on to your head. It's really not that complicated. It just seems like it at first, but uh, uh, you got to get on board. And, and that's what these people have done to get the loans and, and the other things that they've done. Um, Dan, and I would stress that there's always contacts at USDA um, and the Farm Service Agency here in Minnesota that can help you navigate our programs and you know help you figure out the forms and talk to you about you know what information is needed as well. And at the end of the presentation, I will have some information on contact information um, for, for individuals you can get a hold of. Um, and then I will throw my email address in the chat as well. Um, Dan, this is Lori. I heard at the beginning you and Chris had also introduced yourselves as also doing outreach. By what channels or how are you providing outreach so that these folks within these areas actually know about one, your office, and two, um, how to actually sign up or cooperate, as you said, with FSA? Absolutely. Um, so 
when we're doing outreach, we do kind of a combination of things, both outreach and communications. Um, you know, communications, of course, focuses on, you know, press releases and media content and trying to get that information out through you know, some broader sources. Um, but a lot of our outreach is done through things like our partner organizations. Um, I think about the, the Sustainable Farming Association and University of Minnesota Extension and Minnesota Farmers Union um, as being core partners in helping us get the word out. Um, some of it has been about you know, really researching and looking for operations and organizations that support urban agriculture and suburban agriculture through the Metro and having direct conversations with those organizations and asking them, hey, can we get connected with people that you're working with? Or, you know, in the last couple months, I've had over 100 phone calls and direct contact with organizations and individuals um, who are growing within the Twin Cities Metro. So it's that combination of, you know, starting, you know, with media and, and communications work and working with, you know, some of our stakeholders that are our core partners and getting this information out and working with some of those local organizations that we've identified and then really getting down to the individuals and operations that are actually growing you know, within these areas. And so we really hope that through our work with organizations like the Twin Cities Metro Growers Network, that this is our opportunity to connect and really inform people about what USDA FSA has to offer as well as you know, the broader department. And, and so if there are contacts that you know or any of the other attendees, um, please you know, reach out to us because we want to be connecting or if there are maybe organizations that you, know, you work with that would like to host an informational session, we would be very excited about that. Thank you. Yeah, I much appreciate it. Dan, yep. one thing to add there is, you know, that's the goal of these new committee members that we're trying to recruit and, and say they'll be a nominee for this election is if you have a passion and you fit you know, into these LAA areas that you could represent that area. One of your um, main duties or the ask that we would have is for you to also promote and help us educate and uh, recruit other growers that fit in the, the urban ag category that maybe haven't been identified by FSA in the past. Does USDA then also have some folks in office or some also way to navigate different languages? A yeah, very good question. So at USDA, we have what we refer to as limited English proficiency services. So in each service center, we have the capacity to use a language interpretation line um, that is available 24 seven um, and can provide um, language interpretation, um, both for customers when they're in person in our office um, and when they're utilizing um, like telephone services. Um, the other thing that we can do is if there are fact sheets or forms or information that we're providing to an audience um, that has a specific language need, we can request translation of those documents. Um, and so those are some options that we have um, that we've utilized in the past and continue to utilize to try to better serve customers with mm -hmm. their proficiency. Mm -hmm. This is Lillian. I have a question. Yeah, Lillian. Good to see you here again. Um, I was wondering, and I know you and I have talked about this um, before, but I was just wondering the outreach to perhaps organizations and community um, commu organizations that actually work with communities of color. Um, I know you mentioned SFA, MFU, uh, and those guys, but there might just be an opportunity there uh -huh. to reach out to some of the community leaders. And, and perhaps it just might require, in my opinion, just uh, tweaking that um, outreach or interaction or the delivery of that information in a way that meets the needs of those communities, especially if you're trying to really um, not necessarily be inclusive, but to, to, to reach a, a wider audience, right? Uh, so I was wondering if there's been any thought that's been put to that and, and, and maybe some engagement um, decisions or activities that maybe might be lined up for that. 
Yeah, and I would say that when you talk about, you know, outreach on county committee, um, you know, this goes well beyond um, our urban county committee, right? We're looking to make sure that we have underserved um, representation on county committees, um, not just in an urban metro or suburban area, but throughout the state. And so one of the things that we do annually is develop, you know, outreach strategies to provide information to the broader communities, uh, but also to those organizations. So I think about, um, you know, the Latino Economic Development Committee or the, the Hmong American Farmers Association or um, Hmong American Partnership or Big River Farms or some of these things. So trying to provide information, you know, with organizations that are devoted to directly working with producers um, that are under traditionally underserved. Um, and some of that is working with, you know, farm incubators um, throughout the state that have relationships with people who are truly new to USDA and, and recognizing that as they come through that process and participate and cooperate um, beyond, you know, some of those financial benefits that come out of, you know, having a farm loan, there's also a benefit to, you know, representing the type of agriculture that, that you're engaged in with that county committee. And so, I would say this is one of those areas where, you know, there's a big focus at the department um, and, and that we are continuously trying to develop strategies that are effective around that. Um, so I, I do appreciate that. I'm gonna jump in here. Um, first, Lillian, if you don't mind, uh, for those that don't know, uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot. If you could just introduce yourself so people can learn about the wonderful folks at MDA. <laughs> are you asking us to introduce ourselves? Well, Lillian, just so people know who you are. And, and, oh, and, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's good to see you, Carl. Yes, um, good to I'm see you. Lillian. I'm Lillian Otien. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, currently still with the Produce Safety Program. You know, I'm going to transition into other projects. Um, but yeah, um, interested in working with growers, farmers, Dan and I, uh, and Carl, our meet in other spaces, working with um, communities of color and, and trying to advance and uh, advance those opportunities. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I, thank you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but thank you. And uh, Devon, I think you had your hand up. I did, but I put it back down, Carl. I'm having some, some connection issues. I <laughs> okay. All right. Well, just uh, whenever you're ready, but uh, we can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I sure can. Like I'm a surprise. <laughs> um, so um, I was just wondering, I was thinking about, um, first of all, thank you for your, for your, for sharing the information, Daniel. I was thinking about, um, you know, this conversation around urban ag and, and what that really means for the, for the state. Um, and I'm glad that the conversation has broadened in a way that really um, fosters cohesion throughout our state. I happen to be a Minnesota food charter champion, along with, I believe it, uh, Lillian is as well. Like we've been working at this for a long time. This isn't a, a new conversation. And so um, I'm curious what type of, if any, I, I know you mentioned the farm incubators, maybe that's a form of technical support. I'm wondering what type of, if any technical support is being offered to um, help, you know, farmers and growers who, who may not have, you know, have worked with FSA or USDA before, or like, what are those inroads so that folks, those barriers can continue to be removed? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and, and when I think about that, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is USDA farm loans, right? Um, you know, we, we do a lot of outreach and communications about, you know, the availability of um, loans for beginning farmers, right? Um, but a lot of times, you know, are the details clear to the people that we are sending that information out to um, about what are those requirements for experience? You know, are those requirements different if you're applying for an operating loan versus an ownership loan? And how do we prepare those future borrowers that maybe don't have the experience for that ownership loan today uh, to apply to that, you know, tomorrow, right? And how do we, you know, engage in certain spaces to educate people so that when they do apply, you know, we increase the chances that there's approval of that application. 
Um, and so when I think about that, you know, one of the things that is you know, front of mind for me is some of the work that's happening in Minnesota around SCORE. Um, SCORE is a business mentorship um, program that comes originally to the government through the Small Business Administration, but USDA has a MOU or um, with SCORE to provide some of that technical assistance piece um, for our customers in navigating our programs, including farm loans. And so at the state level, um, we've recognized that some of the SCORE volunteers that we have are maybe less than informed on some of those really technical aspects of applying to USDA farm loans. And so how do we educate them to work with the, the people that they're working with um, to better navigate those programs? And then once we've educated those individuals that are working as, as mentors and volunteers you know, to provide that technical support, how do we then engage in a you know, media and outreach um, campaign to really advertise the availability of those services? And so the other piece of that is, and, and I would say that this is true, and I know that we've got a number of farm loan staff that are on the call currently, um, but that farm loan staff do work directly with customers to kind of help navigate that process as well. But I think that's that's a really good question um, and something that we're continuously working on trying to develop new strategies to provide that technical service because we do know USDA FSA staff are, are busy within the company offices. Great question, great feedback. And I think it'd be safe to, I think it's important to know that this is a pilot and this is gonna be a work in project. project. <laughs> progress, excuse me. And so uh, it'll, we'll have to make it what we want it to be as much as we can sort of thing. Any other questions in the chat there, uh, Katie? There or were um, we... a few, but I'm kind of, uh, they might be answered in Dan's presentation. Yeah, okay. So we can save them for the end and. Okay. And I would just say too, that, you know, I, really appreciate those questions and feedback because I think they illustrate that, you know, the Urban Ag County Committee is only one part, you know, of, of a broader strategy for, you know, connecting producers, you know, with USDA programs. Um, so eligibility to hold office, kind of returning back here, um, you must be a producer with interest in a farming or ranching operation that produces an agricultural commodity for production or sale. And so, you know, the key here is that it's a production, you know, it doesn't have to be for sale, but it's, you know, are you producing? Um, participate or cooperate. We talked about those definitions. Um, be a US citizen, be of legal voting age, um, reside or have farming interest in the county or multi-county jurisdiction in which they serve. And this is a little bit different for um, urban ag county committees versus our traditional county committee in that we really want to make sure that you know just because your you know, residence falls just outside the boundary of that urban ag county committee but you're growing in Minneapolis or St. Paul we want to know that you know you're producing and you are eligible to vote and hold office in that particular situation. Um, be compliant with 22 p.m. conflict of interest requirements um, which is a universal requirement there as well. So Going back then talking about like, what is the role of the Urban Ag County Committee? Um, they represent ranchers and farmers and producers. Um, so it is an elected position. Um, they play a role in administering USDA programs. Um, kind of gave that example of, you know, they are an appeal body, you know, so if there's an appeal on a program, it can go through the county committee. Um, provide public information and outreach. Um, we're always asking our county committee members, like, are we getting information out on this? Is this clear, you know, what's happening? And so that, that feedback that the county committee provides on the public information and outreach that we conduct um, is pretty important to us. And then make sure that we're ensuring equal opportunity. So, you know, part of that, you know, appellate body responsibilities plus that oversight is that equal opportunity requirement and then perform some of those administrative duties. So anytime there are programs, we do look to our county committees um, for recommendations and determinations, kind of an administrative process. 
So we talk about, you know, what are the goals here? Outreach to local stakeholders to promote programs. Uh, we know that county committees have connections at the local level that we might not have through our USDA offices. Um, role is to understand our programs and, and how they impact the producers uh, within that jurisdiction. Identify the needs of growing urban agriculture market within the defined urban area. Engage with a new customer base, you know, um, connecting with other growers. Conduct quarterly meetings. Um, so with this urban ag pilot, there will be a minimum of, you know, four meetings per year or quarterly meetings. And as, you know, the, the county committee structure um, you know, becomes more permanent or, or, or grows, you know, we can fluctuate those meetings, you know, as necessary, but at minimum conduct quarterly meetings. Um, make recommendations on training needs, um, which I think is, is very valuable as well. Urban Ag County Committee continued here, um, review applications, make determinations, um, hear appeals for both FSA and our Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, oversee the farm program work of the county office, um, have knowledge of FSA and pro NRCS programs and, and work to inform. A lot of times our, our county committee members um, do connect us you know, with additional new producers and then provide support to underserved or socially disadvantaged groups and be aware of the programs and benefits available for them. So kind of getting, okay, go ahead. Can I interrupt with a quick clarification? Um, are there producer acre or production minimums to participate? Nope, nope. And and so you know, really, all you have to do is provide an indication that you're you're producing, you know, with that urban ag COC, and provide your your um, address and, and information. Yep. And and I can't stress that enough too. It's it's you know, personal consumption, donation, or, or sales, you know, it's, the, the question is, are you producing or growing? Um, urban COCs are a board of local agriculturalists. Um, they're elected by local agriculturalists. Um, they can report urban ag needs through the administrator, um, the Farm Service Agency administrator, directly to the Secretary of Agriculture. So there's, a, there's an element of, you know, being able to, you know, convey information there. Um, serving on the county committee provides an opportunity to educate you know, producers on FSA programs and participation requirements. And then serving also provides an opportunity to make decisions that can have a real impact on local farmers and ranchers. Uh, we have another question in yep. the chat here. Uh, do you know what kind of time commitment this work requires outside of those quarterly meetings? Outside of those quarterly meetings, it's, it's very minimal. It, it's the meetings are the primary if not only, you know, workload that comes into that. Um, you know, like all committee members, you know, some committee members are more engaged than others, you know, and, and may be, you know, calling and providing feedback or, you know, speaking to community members. But, you know, that, that primary workload is, you know, attending that meeting on a quarterly basis and, and providing feedback and, and looking at the, the cases that are brought to the county committee. Um, how do I participate? So, there are three essential ways, uh, nominate, vote, and inform others. And, you know, we've, we've had a lot of conversation here about that, like outreach piece and outreach is about making connections with people. And so I hope that, you know, if there's individuals or organizations that you're connected with, you feel more than comfortable, you know, sharing information about the county committee or connecting them um, with myself or any of our colleagues here at Armed Service Agency to answer any questions that you might have. So how to nominate, individuals may nominate themselves or others as candidates. Um, additionally, organizations that represent underserved farmers or ranchers may nominate candidates as well. Um, nomination forms are filed for the county committee at the office that administers a producer's farm records. In this case, we're talking about the Farmington office. Um, and this is the email address and office address. Um, for that office and I'll have more contact information for them as well. And we recognize that, you know, it's gonna be a joint effort between the, the state office and our county office on implementing this. So 
of course, there's a form um, to become a nominee. Eligible individuals must sign the nomination form FSA 669A. And this form does include a statement that the nominee agrees to serve if elected. So if maybe a, a organization or another individual nominates somebody, they need to sign that and agree to serve if elected. Um, the form is available um, online, but if you contact your local county office or any of us, we can also get you that form. Um, this is a copy of the FSA 669A, probably not very visible on your screens here. Um, nomination runs from June 15th to August 2nd. Um, like I said, you can nominate yourself or others, and then you must sign that form in order for it to be valid. And Daniel, will you announce yep. it on SUSDAG or something? Nominations Sorry. open. Will you send, yes. send it out to SUSDAG or something? Nominations yep. open, whatever. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. And then, so how can a person vote? Eligible voters are mailed a ballot in November. And, you know, if there was a situation where you didn't receive a ballot, um, you can contact FSA um, and we can verify that you're, you know, on the voting list and, and make sure that you get a ballot. Um, contact your county office, you know, for the, if, in those situations. And then the counting of the ballots is public and we do always publicize that location, date, and time um, through the ballot itself of when they will be counted. So going back to kind of a, a more full look at that timeline, June 15th through August 2nd is our nomination period. Um, November 1st is when those ballots are mailed out. December 6th, is when that last day is to return those ballots to the, the service center. And then January 1st, 2022 is when our newly elected county committee members will take office. So before we kind of talk about, you know, some of the programs at USDA, are there any more questions? Well, I just wanted to throw in here, as many of you know, I worked in rural Wisconsin for many years with mostly dairy farmers, but you know, all kinds of uh, traditional farmers and the FSA committee and the county uh, land conservation and extension committee uh, were part and parcel of kind of rural farming life. And, and uh, back when I started, it was uh, pretty much uh, uh, the older farmers and, and they'd been on these boards forever. And, uh, keeping track of the loan payments or the, you know, price supports and all that. But it was, uh, it was just kind of a known quantity out there. And I think uh, this will be really exciting for people to access uh, USDA, uh, what Lincoln called the people's uh, agency back in 1862 when everybody was farmers pretty much. <laughs> um, so I think we can build that kind of, oh, just kind of common knowledge that, oh, FSA has got this thing or USDA or whatever. So that'll take a while, but um, uh, these committees uh, and a lot of them out there needed some new blood, that's for sure. And uh, hopefully it's changed by then. But uh, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to throw that out there that uh, we can we can build that here. I mean, if you think of Twin Cities and the Metro, that's a huge area that we don't think of as agriculture or farming, but uh, this is all what people on, on board here and, and all of us working on are are changing and it's evolving. So I think this is a, a great way for people to, uh, you know, it's it's our government, it's your government, we gotta get in there. So uh, I, I think this is has huge potential and uh, I will get off my soapbox now, but thank you very much. And then uh, oh, uh, Jennifer asked a clarifying question, uh, but she wanna know if you could revisit briefly how, in, how individuals become eligible voters. It involves registering with FSA office? Yep, so essentially to become an eligible voter, um, what you need to do is provide your name and address to the Farm Service Agency or the USDA. Um, most commonly that is done through the AD 2047 form, um, which um, we can provide a link to directly here. Um, and really it's about providing that name and address at a minimum is considered participating 
and then you know indicating that you're producing you know in Minneapolis or St. Paul or where you're producing so that you can get associated with that correct local administrative area um, or that geographical area that we talked about. And I will put my information too in the chat here towards the end. And if you're you know, interested in, in doing that, you can get in contact with me directly and I can help you through that process as well. Um, Daniel, this is Lori. Um, I see all of this is great. And I think having this obviously in the urban setting has been a very long time coming of really pushing um, and doing outreach and things of that nature. I guess through my own experiences with FSA, out in my county, the issue has really gone down to um, the education level, quite frankly, on the agent's behalf of what uh, things are applicable to more urban farms. And secondly, I'm unsure of how you are matching, I guess, what some of the needs are based upon the fact that USDA and FSA offices only look at things typically with a farm number so, you know, a farm and parcel number, you know what I'm talking about, but mm -hmm. how is this differentiating, I guess, within this pilot to say, maybe that's not how we always look at things? Is USDA being open to that? Yeah, I think so in terms of, of certain aspects. Um, so, you know, if you look at certain programs that we have, they might have an acreage based payment, right? And that payment is tied to an annual certification of crop acreage, right? And a person can't certify those acres unless they have that land drawn out as a farm and they've signed the FSA 578 crop acreage report, right? Right. Um, so an example of maybe some departure from that might be the coronavirus food assistance program. Um, for certain crops, they were acreage-based crops. And so there was a requirement for an FSA 578 or that certification to be on file. And then there were other crops that were considered sales-based commodities. And so we were looking at payments based on 2019 sales, if a producer was operating in 2019, or looking at 2020 sales, if 2020 was that, that first year of operation. And so maybe in that particular situation, there wasn't necessarily a need to have a farm number drawn out. And then I would say, you know, when we're talking about urban ag county, maybe more specifically, um, there is no need to have a farm drawn out. Um, and I think part of the, the, the challenge administratively at FSA is we have your name, we have your address, you know, maybe we have your email and phone number. But if we don't have you associated with a farm number in our system, we're not sure where you're farming. And so making sure that if you are one of those producers that is providing that 80, 20, 47, that you know, we're also notified that you're a producer and making sure that we get you associated with that correct local administrative area and have you participating in the county committee. Right. And I guess, you know, I am on 16 acres. So yes, I have, you know, a, a farm number and have even prior to me I coming here, but I take a look at what the urban agriculture, you know, community works in. And even myself, I had things notated in tenths of acres. Um, and I guess that would really be something for USDA to consider if you could take this back to someone and Michelle included. FSA offices should be able to help whomever, because if you're going to do outreach and you're going to say, we want to help urban ag, well, urban ag on what amount? So, you know, a quarter acre, 100 by 100, believe it or not, feeds a lot of people and can actually make a lot of money. Uh -huh. um, and so I look at these things and saying, is that a part of this pilot? Because you know that you're not going off a farm number. So could there be departure after this five-year program to say we need to treat urban ag differently? And frankly, I think you also know that through the uh, census of ag, we are counting uh, very much so, and this can certainly be in urban locations, aquaponics, and that could be sitting inside a warehouse and nobody knows it. So, you know, I'm trying to take a look at what I see today as data and what I might be able to see tomorrow as data and how important that is. And I absolutely appreciate uh, USDA and FSA doing this, 
I just hope that we take a look at it for what it is um, and that it typically will not be a farm number. Yeah, very much appreciated on that. And I know, you know, through some of the conversation that I've had, you know, specifically around urban ag is, is that land access is a major issue. So you might, you know, have that farm number, but you could be changing the location of your farm year to year because of those challenges of land access. And so that, that administrative process becomes burdensome to, you know, identify these, you know, locations and draw them out and, and, and those things as well. And those are some concerns that, you know, certainly, you know, pass over to certain rural areas, but are somewhat unique to metropolitan areas of that extreme land access change. And I, I think too, like that's the kind of feedback that, through this pilot and through the conversations that we're having right now, we're able to provide, you know, to the administrator and to the secretary's office um, that I think hopefully will, will inform some of those policies and programs of the future. Yeah, any other additional questions? There were a couple in chat from Vicki and I see she just hopped off unfortunately, but um, her questions were with regards to what the committee may or may not be focused on. So she was wondering um, if the pilot focused on regenerative agriculture or permaculture principles, um, if it included mitigation of industrial ag practices impacting water, soil, air, um, and human health, things like that. Does it depend on you know who, who's part of the committee? And, and typically when we're looking at a county committee structure, you know, the first thing that we're looking at is, you know, administration of USDA Farm Service Agency programs. Um, but we're also looking at Natural Resource Conservation Service. So to the extent that those things would align with existing programs, there's potential that there could be, you know, activity around those. Um, and then that other piece is, you know, what are the pieces of information that that county committee determines that they want shared directly with the administrator and secretary his office um, regarding, you know, FSA, NRCS, and USDA activity. So I think, you know, the comment that you made about um, that that will depend on who's on that county committee and who they're networked with and, and what that county committee determines they want to share for information um, is definitely relevant. But I think also recognizing, you know, what is the scope of what the Farm Service Agency does and NRCS does and, and what um, USDA does as a whole. So I, I think there's potential that some of those things would be, you know, points of conversation. Um, yeah, if they align. Uh, I, I essentially answered Vicki uh, on the chat. And, and Jen, Jennifer, if you want to hang with us for a second, we'll get your question answered. Uh, Jennifer asks, uh, there, there are so many of us who have never interacted with USDA, especially in the community garden space, who I think it's important to make sure we have access to vote, but it feels like a big lift in the next few months. So I guess she's saying, it's great that people can participate, but it may be kind of quick. So, yes, uh, yep, yep, absolutely. And I and I would stress that it's a phone call, it's an email, it's you know one form, you know that we're looking at, you know, for participation in this at this point. Um, we are not looking at you know anybody, you know, taking office until January uh, of the following year here, and so you know it can be a very minimal. Um, process in order to provide that name and address to, to USDA to participate, you know, and you can make that evaluation, you know, on a personal basis of, you know, whether you have that, you know, capacity or time um, to, to participate as a you know, member or, you know, nominate um, yourself uh, as part of the county committee. But I, I do recognize that, you know, farmers and growers, you know, have a limited time um, and capacity to do some of these things. So that and people can just show up and attend meetings. They don't have to be on the committee, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, you know, meetings are open, you know, during the um, regular session um, to the public. So, absolutely. Daniel, are you using the same outreach types then to let folks know when those occur ahead of time? Is there a schedule somewhere they could look at? And would you be reaching out to let those folks know? Yeah, I would say that we're using a lot of those same, you know, outreach and communications tools. And the, the other piece is that once we have identified individuals, you know, who are participating by, you know, providing that name and address, there is a postcard that goes directly to those individuals. 
um, notifying them that the nomination period is open. So, you know, there's some direct communication as well with those identified eligible voters, which I think is pretty important. Thank you. Was it one per those three districts or how many, I forget. In terms of um, LAAs up for election or? I mean, how many people would end up being? Yeah, one person per LAA, yes. Yep. Yeah, so okay, so it's only gonna be three people and then there'll be somebody like you, an FSA person there, correct? Correct, yep, and, yeah. and like we said, it's administered through the Farmington office, you know, so because that office, you know, serves this geographical area. And so it would be implemented, you know, with FSA staff from state office and Farmington office, you know, participating and, and helping facilitate those county. And so they'd be the mothership. Dan, there was a question in the chat, sort of applicable now in this conversation about um, location of those meetings. And so I just responded that that's to be determined, but we have based on those three members that are elected to serve and their um, location may help determine whether we have those meetings in St. Paul at our state office or versus Farmington and consider, you know, ride share options, see what the COVID situation is and versus virtual and all those good things. So we'll decide that after our members are elected, but it was a very good question. Yep, and just trying to be responsive to our elected members needs on that. All right, well, that, that's excellent. And so um, you have up on the screen selected USDA programs. <clears throat> and I think so, for, for the uninitiated, it's kind of amazing what's out there. And, and again, the USDA programs and protocols can be intimidating at first, but um, uh, they offer a lot of great things. Yeah, and we had someone ask about this in the chat already, if you could be sure to highlight the, the USDA funded growers programs that are in the cities or maybe they, all of these are available to everyone, but um, yeah, if you could just highlight those for Catherine, that'd be great. Yep. Yeah, I see I see the names of the of the programs, but it'd be interesting to, to just to have some examples of what's going on. Are there any like rooftop gardens? Are there any, um, you know, farm to school programs that have taken off. What, what are some programs that you can highlight that you funded recently? The FDA, or excuse me, the USDA. <laughs> yes, so my specific knowledge tends to be around the Farm Service Agency, you know, and some of the things that um, we have for programs because that's you know, where I sit. Um, but I can tell you that a number of different programs um, have been utilized, you know, in the state, you know, um, some of which have been utilized in more recent years. Um, so I, I think about, you know, under the Office of Partnership and Public Engagement, um, there's the Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers Program, that 2501 program, um, mm -hmm. the Latino Economic Development um, Center in Minnesota utilized this program I believe they were funded in 2019. I don't think a Minnesota project was funded in 2020, but there, you know, that's grant money that was utilized by a nonprofit in our state to do outreach um, and, and engagement projects with the Farm Service Agency here in Minnesota specifically. Um, and so there are, you know, cooperatives um, that operate here in the Minneapolis, um, St. Paul area that, you know, receive some of that funding. So that's that's an example that I think about, um, you know, and and other examples of, you know, money that's come through um, federal agencies that have been, you know, adjacent to USDA. I think about some of the local foods, local places, activities that have happened um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul as examples of that as well. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of other ones that have been done. I know the EQIP, that Environmental Quality Incentive Program, there is a hoop house um, funding that's available to that for cost share. And I know there are a few community gardens um, and food um, distribution organizations that have utilized that to obtain um, hoop houses for their operations within the Twin Cities Metro. Um, I know when we're talking about, and I'll go into a little bit more into FSA programs, there are some farm loan participants or farm storage facility loan participants in, in that broader um, metropolitan area that have participated in this as well. And I think, 
when I look at this list, I, I think the big picture is that in some of our previous conversations with folks around urban ag, they say, does USDA have any funding for urban ag? You know, and some of it is urban ag specific and some of it is, you know, more broadly ap applicable across rural and urban agriculture. And then the other piece that I'd point out is that some of these things are directly for producers, right? And then some of these are for the organizations that support producers or communities. And so when you look at the Farm Service Agency more specifically, our focus tends to be commercial agriculture. And so, you know, if, that, if that's a limiting factor for participation in USDA programs for a particular individual, maybe looking outside of some of those elements to other things that are happening at USDA, but also recognizing that that's some of the feedback that we're gonna get, that there maybe is an insufficient number of programs that align with urban ag. So the, the way I like to look at it is that uh, we use this term urban ag now, which is fine, but it's really ag in urban areas. So it's agriculture and if it's agriculture, uh, they fund it, you know, you're not gonna get grain storage for your corn cause you don't need it. But uh, there's a lot of things here that, um, if, if, and so it's kind of, essentially we're kind of expanding the definition of agriculture to go way beyond commodity ag. Um, I know uh, 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 Moses and Lona out there in Dawn to Dust Farm, they took out an FSA loan. I think Keisha Witter took out an FSA loan. Really helpful with people that want to take the next step and really start becoming a market grower. Um, uh, that's not a requirement, I don't think, but uh, a lot of people use that. And then uh, Dan mentioned NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. They tend to be the technical arm and they offer cost sharing for hoop houses and different things. And FSA, you know, kind of handles the money, let's say. And so um, it, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of things out there. And the, and the beginning farmer rancher loans and, and some of those are really low interest um, compared to commercial banks. Um, and so, uh, again, it takes a little while to figure this stuff out, uh, but um, with people like Daniel and Christina on board, <laughs> we can get it figured out. Any other questions? A comment on, on, on what you just said, Carl, and I think somebody did mention this, I think earlier in the call about uh, a need for educating, you know, the service providers in, in those areas. I think some of the feedback that I have also heard from, you know, some of the small size farmers, urban ag or, you know, farmers of color who mostly are maybe farming in smaller scales. It's, it almost seems like there's a challenge in terms of, in terms of scaling down those resources and making them applicable to, to these farmers. And I think it's a matter of maybe some education um, on those service providers to, to look at uh, these producers uh, with a view, with, with, with that angle so that they can still benefit from these services. I think there's, there's, there's recent uh, conversations that have been had in, in certain areas, and maybe Dan, you're aware of that, on, on some of those missed opportunities. So, so maybe the education of, of these service providers would be helpful. Uh, but I certainly do appreciate uh, USDA going in this direction. It's it's been much needed and I think it's very welcome. So uh, I just I really just, appreciate that. I just want to, I was the person who said it, Lillian, thank you. It's Lori. Um, I agree with that. And again, I'm, a, I'm in a third tier suburb out here in Carver County and we're rural. Um, so even us folks who are out here um, didn't have the education background of the agencies to give us the help we needed. And so I just want to make sure that indeed um, the folks in St. Paul offices are saying, yes, our agents are fully versed in what, you know, production looks like um, for one, smaller folks, and two, for urban folks, because you certainly don't have to be in an urban area to be a direct-to-consumer market farmer. Um, so I just want to make sure that you folks feel that, yeah, we're absolutely prepared. And I, would, I was just making sure that I'm unmuted here. Um, I, I would say too, if there are specific um, pieces of information regarding your personal experience or you know, those things that you know, could help us inform um, how we better serve our customers, we're always you know, receptive to those things. And I think um, like any 
you know, business, you know, our, our staff and our county offices are, are comfortable working with producers and they might have, you know, 1500 producers in a county that are, are growing, you know, under one model and, and, you know, 10 that are growing under another. And we would need to make sure that we're, you know, serving those 1500 producers in the same way that we serve the 10 and serving the 10 in the same way that we serve the 1500. And so making sure that, you know, we have that ability is important. And so any feedback that you can provide us is, is always appreciated on that line. Yep. Thank you guys. And, yeah. And I, back to Lillian's comment, um, I'm guessing this uh, committee, this new one, is going to spend a lot of time educating folks about what goes on with uh, FSA and, and all the rest of it. I mean, I think that'll be a big part of their charge um, uh, as this thing gets rolling. Is to, yeah. and I, I think the other piece is just recognizing that you know, <clears throat> when when we have farm service agency programs, we may not have had a program that you know provides direct payments to Christmas tree growers. Per, previously, but coronavirus food assistance program becomes available. And all of a sudden we need to, you know, engage with those Christmas for great producers. We need to, you know, be prepared to serve them. And so th that shift in agriculture or shift in eligibility of programs, um, you know, is part of that process too for us at FSA. So much appreciated. And then, so the next thing I have here is just a quick outline of some of the commercial um, programs through FSA that, that we have that I think align directly with some of our urban egg growers. You know, and the first one is that coronavirus food assistance program. So I, I want to stress that, you know, this is a program that's has a really broad applicability to, you know, 230 plus different um, types of commodities. And so if you or somebody you know was selling commercially um, in 2020, chances are that the coronavirus food assistance program aligns. And that's definitely true for our urban growers, you know, whether they're selling in farmers markets or, or selling, you know, directly to you know, grocery stores. Um, and the important thing here is that that has been reopened. It originally closed December 11th and it was reopened on April 5th for a minimum of 60 days. And the sign-up deadline has not been announced, but it will be at a later date. And so if this is something that you haven't looked at, I would encourage you, you know, to contact your local FSA office. Um, it's a relatively simple process and you know, they can guide you directly through whether that would be applicable for you. Um, but it's very important because it has been reopened and it's direct payments. This is not a loan, this is a direct payment. Um, Farm storage facility loans. So we, you know, talking about like, you know, what is this conventionally used for? What commonly is for? Grain dryers and um, grain storage facilities. And, and I think it's important to note that this is really for any handling and storage equipment across a really broad list of commodities. And while that um, list of commodities is finite, county committees are one of the structures by which we request additional commodity eligibility under this program. And what it is, it's a low interest loan and it's a very low interest loan for those storage and handling things. And that includes things like cold storage mobile um, handling trucks or cold storage for fruits and vegetables. Um, so it, it's fairly broad and we've seen vegetable growers uh, purchase things like tool cats um, with that. So um, if there is something that, you know, there's a business need for, for a commercial grower there is that low interest loan outside of our more formal farm loan um, structure. Um, Non-insured crop disaster assistance program. Um, so we, we know about you know, federally subsidized crop insurance through the Risk Management Agency. Um, in addition to that, there is NAP or that non-insured crop disaster assistance program, which provides crop insurance alternates um, for commodities, um, commonly fruits and vegetables and things that aren't covered under um, traditional crop insurance. So that's something that can be uh, applicable to an urban grower. Um, and then the other thing is that a lot of the USDA FSA programs that we have are really focused on people who are currently growing. And so disaster programs are an example of this. Um, the emergency assistance for livestock, um, honeybees and farm raised fish. This is an example of that um, where it's for you know, disasters that occur you know, to, to different types of, of livestock including honeybees and farm-raised fish. Um, tree assistance program, 
disaster program for um, vineyards and orchardists and, and tree losses um, due to, to um, natural disaster. Um, and then the livestock indemnity program, which is another disaster program um, for the loss of livestock. And so these are things that, you know, hopefully our growers don't need, but when they do, we wanna make sure that they're aware that there is a program that provides that assistance. And just want to make sure, Dan, that when you're talking about these FSA programs, these are all eligible to people who would register, obviously, um, with USGA FSA, but again, do not have a farm number. Is that correct? So some of these things require farm numbers. Um, and, and most of these programs, well, all these programs require it to be commercial production. Right. That's where I guess I'm, I'm going to go back to the second you know, part of feedback of saying somehow, somewhere, um, if you want to talk about urban ag and you want to talk about serving urban ag, if, if USDA is going to start to recognize certain areas to place a brand new farm number on, I don't know what mm -hmm. you guys' thoughts are on that, uh, but there have been areas of cities that have been set aside. Um, you know, Twin Cities, um, oh, I'm forgetting the T cult, um, Ag Land Trust. You know, those are areas that have been permanently set aside that cannot be developed. So if we're talking things like that, could USDA, you know, start to take a look at those things and say that actually is now eligible for a farm number? Why wouldn't it be? Yep. And I would say that, you know, we'd have to look at those things on a case by case basis, you know, and whether, whether an individual, you know, has control of that land or, you know, how we're going to draw that out depending on ownership and things like that. Um, but, you know, if you're producing on that, you know, we on a regular basis do draw out new farms um, as we become aware of, you know, new ag land and people um, go through that process with us. And I would say too, you know, when you look at this list, the coronavirus food assistance program, some of the commodities here require a farm number. Some of them are those, those sales crops that don't. Um, farm facility loan, you know, we do look at production records to determine storage needs. Um, Non-insured crop disaster does require um, acreage reporting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, ELAP, um, we typically, because of the acreage reporting requirement for honeybees, typically there's a farm number, but it's usually delineation of actually the location of the headquarters for that operation. Um, TAP would be the same way. And then the livestock indemnity program does not require a farm number. If I remember. Mm -hmm. so some of that is on a case by case basis, you know, the need for a farm number. Um, depending on the provisions of those individual programs. But I, I appreciate the, the notion that that can be, you know, for, for the relationship. Right. And that's why I'm trying to just focus on this of the audience you're, you know, giving to this to today. Is this even applicable then? That's what I'm trying mm -hmm. to understand. Yep. Yep. And I, and I would say too, that that notion that FSA programs focus on commercial growers, but the distinction that the urban ag COC focuses on any type of grower, you know, whether you're growing commercially, you know, for personal consumption or donation, USDA is saying, you know, we want you to participate or you're eligible to participate in this county committee structure. And the feedback that you provide is, is something that they're looking for. Right. So I just want to make sure again, you, you believe commercial can be urban on a quarter acre. I mean, that's, that can yeah. absolutely be a commercial. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is Oh, go ahead. Oh. I'd just like to make a comment to this is Michelle um, from FSA. Listening to the concerns that have been noted and, um, and some of the questions asked, I just want to restate that this is a, this urban ag county committee is a perfect opportunity to elevate those concerns to the secretary of ag and the FSA administrator. Because maybe right now, some of the programs that Dan's outlined, maybe they don't right now fit for urban ag, but this is an opportunity to voice those concerns and have them consider at the national level, well, what changes do we need to make so that it, there, these programs are more um, available for our urban ag um, producers. So good feedback. I know Dan's been taking notes and the, we have opportunity and engagement on occasion where we can bring these things forth to, um, they don't, right, not right to the secretary in, on my, in, in my regard, but we do, we can elevate them at the national level and get them to the right people. So thank you for the feedback, really appreciate it. 
And Laurie quickly asks, uh, what's the best way to make those contacts and suggestions? To, to feed that, those things uh, up, the, up the chain, I, uh, I would say. Um, well, I guess once we get the, once we get the um, Urban Ag County Committee in place, that will yeah. be a good opportunity because they have direct access based on what we've been told. Um, in the interim, if you want to shoot those questions, I, I know there's contact information in the, um, that's been put in the chat for FSA, Dan, Chris, myself, um, send those up and we can get them to the national office. Because I'm guessing that we're not, you're not, this isn't the only state that has this, um, these concerns. And the fact that this is a pilot, it's a perfect opportunity to, to um, formulate how we want things to move um, going forward. So send the questions in for now and we'll, we'll yeah, get them. Excellent. And I want to be respectful of people's time and, and, and we're just about done here. And uh, I want to say a few words about what's coming up with the network. And um, yeah, I, I think that's it. I mean, this is a work in progress and, and we can, we can, uh, we have to get in there and, and bend this needle and, 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 uh, and uh, make some noise and be a part of our government, Dave. We are the government. Hey, uh, Dan, did you have much more then? The, the last thing that I would just say before I move is that, you know, USDA FSA does have farm loans, you know, everything from direct operating yeah. loans to ownership loans and microloans. And these are equally applicable to, you know, urban agriculture. Um, and please don't hesitate in reaching out um, to USDA FSA if you do have, um, you know, questions about these programs, urban agriculture or anything else. I'll just quickly slip over to the contact section so that anybody can just see that quick. And that's the Dakota, Washington, Ramsey, Scott, USDA Farm Service Agency, or directly to the um, USDA FSA state office as well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, that's what I tell people. Uh, get on this wonderful thing called a telephone and call people and talk to them. <laughs> and uh, a bunch of information in the chat there. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel um, and Christina and Michelle. And, and for everybody part, part participating, excellent discussion. So thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, pay attention, uh, Dan will be sending out announcements for this election nomination, nominate yourself or nominate you somebody you think would be awesome. And, uh, and Katie, thank you so much. And so Dan, any, uh, anybody, uh, last word? Thank you. And I, I look forward to connecting with any of you who reach out. That's what I would, I would push last and appreciate the feedback. Excellent. Uh, you, you're doing great work there, Daniel. Thank you so much.